so the, the normal semesters, the last three weeks are devoted to basically circuits. And um, I, we lead it with the introduction to oscilloscope because it's the tool that you'll be using for quite a bit for the next two weeks uh, with the time dependent circuits and then AC circuits. And the lab plan this semester, you will be doing some time dependent and or AC circuits, but they will be based on simulation. Um, I don't think, so with those labs, they can actually be done fairly well through simulation. So we are, you'll be doing it through simulation and what you will kind of miss out on is uh, working with oscilloscope. So, um, uh, I want you to at least uh, show you this much. Uh, um, show show you this much about the operation of the oscilloscope. So it, it it's not exactly possible to make up for the lack of um, actually working with oscilloscope, but um, because you know it's uh, one of those things where you learn a lot more from handling it, kind of um, turning the knobs yourself. And there's just no way you can do that this semester. But I can at least demonstrate some things to you. So uh, when you look at this manual, you do see this um, kind of front face of the oscilloscope. And you know, when you first look at it, it looks intimidating. That's why I'm saying it's, um, uh, it's one of those things that's better learned just with your hands, uh, working with your hands. So uh, I'm on this uh, unusual new computer because um, this is, was the only computer where I ca could have set up the video setup. So let me switch it to that video setup. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, I need to switch over to that other video setup. Um, so. So this is the video setup I have that will highlight what. Um, so that'll the, the that'll show the equipment the best. So this is the oscilloscope. Let me turn it on, and I guess right now you don't really see anything. And uh, I think the reason I wanted it to be on this uh, camcorder is so that um, because it's a uh, well, you know, I don't know if it's a better camera than the my cell phone camera. The cell phone cameras are actually pretty good these days. But with the camcorder on a tripod, I do have more control. I think if I wanted to zoom in to certain parts, then it's done much more easily with this than it would be with the camcorder. So, um, yeah, and I hope my video is... Uh, I hope my voice is coming through okay. If it's not, someone please let me know in the chat so that I know. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I kind of wanted to have this control, so <laughs> that's why we are on this unusual setting. Uh, so there's, I, I don't think there's a way I can smoothly move this. Um, and and uh, where in places where um i need to i want you to be able to look at the instructions i can show you this setup uh, with the the web browser on one of the screens if we need to refer to the instructions um and again i hope this is reasonably readable if it's not uh someone please let me know in the chat so that i'll know to zoom in or, or i don't know do something so so first, I want you to just, uh, I don't know, play with the oscilloscope. So, I mean, I'm not going to go through act these actual instructions. I'll probably do some parts of it. I think I might go through this uh, diagram and show you the uh, different parts of the oscilloscope. And um, I might do some of the exercises, uh, especially the ones involving a little bit of circuit. You guys saw this uh, breadboard last time, and um, and not last time. You know, last time I did the circuit, and uh, I I can uh, build the vo voltage divider oh, once I get the registers. But let me do that a little bit later. Uh, right now, what I want to do is show you the operation of oscilloscope. What oscilloscopes do. 
right now it's a you know just a blinking thing and um let's see do i want to zoom in uh, i'll zoom in in a little bit and you know so when you work with oscilloscope it's uh you kind of need a signal to be put in um to see something that's more interesting than a flat line so let me let me put in some signal. That's what these two things are for. They are called the function generators, and um, they generate function. Wait, why aren't they turning on? Oh, wait, that's duty cycle. <laughs> Sorry, where's the power button? I think it might be in the back. Oh, oh there it is. <laughs> uh, that's the <laughs> trouble with this. Some oscilloscope. This power button is actually a fairly obvious power button. There are oscilloscopes where sometimes it takes a new user, uh, I don't know, uh, five, not five minutes. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but sometimes actually takes five minutes for someone new to find the power button. So, um, so let me set one of these function generators at a one kilohertz. So there's a range button here. I'm gonna press the five k that lets me set up to um, uh, five kilohertz so or higher um, <laughs> right now it's at uh, 5600 hertz so let me bring it down a little bit and put it at around one kilohertz one kilohertz is a reasonable amount of frequency it's uh, easy to display on an oscilloscope and um, so when you're displaying things on oscilloscopes there are two different places where things can be challenging. It can be challenging because something is too fast, or it can be challenging because something is too slow. Um, and I, I don't think these function generators go fast enough where it's uh, challenging because it's too fast. So, um, so I'm just connecting this to the output in case I need want to duplicate a signal. Um, so that I can get two different outputs. It's called T. Oh, wait. this is what it looks like. It's called T. Um, and it, it basically puts whatever is connected at these two ends in parallel connection. And I'm going to take the output from this function generator here and put it into channel one. And that'll give me at least something to play with. Yeah. So. Uh, right now, on this oscilloscope, it's a setup to display both A and B. I'm going to uh, take the B out. And uh, so this function generator is set at that one kilohertz, and I'm not going to be messing with it too much. So let me, do I, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to be messing with it. So let me zoom into the oscilloscope so that you can see that better. All right. So I hope the, um, sometimes there's a bit of an aliasing effect when you have, so, you know, this refreshes at a particular rate. And when you combine that with the refresh rate of camera, sometimes that as a um, artifact. And uh, I'm not saying that right now, but, you know, if you see something weird, um, <laughs> it could have been. So um, right now, this oscilloscope doesn't, oh wait, eh, I messed it, it's fine. <laughs> um, let me mess it up so that uh, this oscilloscope, eh, does it? All right, it's just gonna see some, show something stable, that's fine. Okay, so this is showing the signal that the function generator is putting out. Um, so, so it looks like a sine wave, and it is. Uh, the function generator, it, Oh, well, I don't want to move the camera again. Oh, let's see. The function generator, it has uh, three modes. Um, let's see, can you read this? This uh, The shape above this button looks like a sine wave. That's what it's showing here. It has other shapes. It has a square wave and it has triangular wave. And those have uses in different applications. Usually when we talk about signal at a particular frequency, we are talking about sine wave. So that's what this is showing. So, so yeah, at the very um, basic, this is what oscilloscope 
does or looks like. I guess uh, there are, I'm looking at the settings here and uh, some of the settings are set up. Let's see, how do I explain it? Um, let's see. Uh, let me do it this way. I'm going to move the function generator on top of the oscilloscope so that you can see them both. And I'm going to demonstrate some of the settings that this oscilloscope is on right now. So, um, so on this function generator, it, uh, it has something called the DC offset. I can introduce a DC offset to the signal. So I can press this. And supposedly, when I turn this knob, uh, wait, you can't see that knob. <laughs> Let me go to, okay, which one is it? Not this, not this. Um, okay, let me do it this way. <laughs> so when you, um, so I press the, this knob, DC offset, and supposedly when I turn this button, that's supposed to change the DC offset. And when I turn it, you do see something happening, like uh, the signal, as I turn it, the signal seems to be moving a little bit. And in fact, when I uh, go to a particular limit, the signal is distorting even. But what it's not doing is actually changing the DC offset. And there's a reason for that. The reason is this mode here, um, the coupling mode for the oscilloscope, it's on what's called the AC mode. And AC mode is the one that's designed to designed to uh, take out any DC offset. So, um, so normally when you, especially when you are a new user of oscilloscope, the mode you want to be in is DC. Even when your signal isn't strictly DC, because when it's on DC, that means whatever voltage signal is put in here, it's a passed through. So now when I change the DC offset, you see, oh yeah, <laughs> that explains why the signal was distorting. Because as I raise the DC offset, it probably reaches some maximum level where um, where the function generator can't uh, put voltage above that anymore. And when I go the other way, I'm decreasing the DC offset, and there's some level at which the function generator can't uh, put beyond that. And in fact, I think I can uh, test it and see. Let's see here. So uh, you can actually, so what an oscilloscope is, is fundamentally, it's a device that displays a voltage as a function of time. So what that means is you can use it to read the voltage. You can, um, let me, my camera back up. Um, you, you can use this to uh, measure voltage and you can do it as a function of time and um, you can also, I, I can for example measure the voltage right at the bottom here where the voltage seems to be getting cut off. So this is how you measure it. Um, let's see, do I want to zoom in further? Let me see if I can zoom in further. Looks like you barely see the things there. Need to see. Um, so I'm on channel A. The channel A, this knob shows a bunch of, you know, there's a dial here, and the dial has some, also shared with some numbers around, and you can use those numbers to make a measurement. So, um, so when you look at this uh, knob carefully, you see that it's slightly asymmetric. There's a um, longer, uh, longer, I don't know what you call it, uh, bump here. And that bump points to the setting of the knob. And uh, oh, before I do that, there's one thing I have to be careful with. There's this middle knob, this middle knob here. It can be used to uncalibrate the oscilloscope. <laughs> so I have to make sure that it's turned all the way clockwise. That's when the oscilloscope is calibrated and I can actually trust the readings I get here. So, so right now this uh, long, this uh, taller bump is pointing at a number 0.5. Uh, what that means is, ah, here it is. It's a volts per division. So when the oscilloscope is on this setting, one division is, is giving you 0.5 volts. So you 
as you look at the screen, this is how the divisions are set up. Each one of these larger screen, larger square is a division. So vertically, there are a total of eight divisions. And um, so, um, so reading from the bottom, you know, zero, one, um, one point, I guess six divisions or so. But oh, but I guess I shouldn't be reading from bottom. I have no guarantee that the bottom is the zero volt. So, hmm. So I probably should find the zero volt first. So on oscilloscope, where the zero volt is, it, that's indicated by ground. So when I put this oscilloscope to ground, then where the readings are, that's uh, where the zero volt is. And I think that's a fairly close to the middle, except it's a little bit tilted, <laughs> and um, that something's probably a little bit broken with the oscilloscope. Um, but it's a little bit above the midpoint. So I think this position knob can be used to, to uh, the you know where this position knob can be used to change the position of the the trace. And when you turn this, you are not changing any voltage. You're just changing where the where the signal gets plotted. So here I'm basically changing where my zero volt is. I can set it here if I want, you know, one to three division from the bottom, or I can set it all the way down here if I want. Then you know, when I go back to the signal, the signal won't even show because it's a way of screen down in the negative range. So let me put in the middle since that's the most reasonable default location. So somewhere around here is, yeah, that's uh, about the middle. That's, uh, um, <laughs> so, so with this setting, now the middle is at zero volt. So when I turn this to DC, then I can see that, oh, all my voltages are negative. And the most negative portion is at one to, about two and a half divisions. So 0.5 is a 0.5 volt is a division. So that means um, that's about what one point um, minus 1.3 volt or so. That's where this is maxing out. That seems a little bit low. I thought this could have put more voltage. Uh, let me try this. I'm going to um, I. On the function generator, I see that there's a button press thing that says minus 20 dB. Um, it usually, I usually press that to make the, um, this button here, minus 20 dB. I usually press that when I want to, uh, can you even read it? Yeah, I think I, I think you can read it. Um, I usually press it when I want the output voltage to be small, but maybe that changes the maximum voltage as well. So I'm going to unpress it and yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So this function generator, it can output more than minus 1.6 volts. So I unpressed that. So let's just get to see what the, the absolute maximum. Okay, yeah. So yeah, that, uh, 20 dB button changes the uh, voltage range by about a factor of 10. So right now my voltage knob is at where it points at five volts per division. So where that, uh, let me double check to make sure my ground is still at zero. Um, and where the, where the minimum most negative possible voltage is at is minus five, Minus 10, minus 10.2, not 10 point, minus 12, minus 13 volts or so. So that's the most negative voltage that this function generator can output. And if I increase the DC offset, it'll max out at the most positive end and it maxes out at about the same range, um, about plus 12 volts or so. So this function generator can output plus minus 12 volts. And you can, I mean, so, you know, if you're in the lab, you can play with it, kind of see what you can do. And what I want you to do uh, for the next, uh, I don't know, couple, not couple, next little while is just to play with the setting 
um, show you some pretty pictures I can show, especially when you have two function generators. And um, yeah, so there's one more part of the oscilloscope that needs a little bit of a explanation. Uh, that's the so I said a voltage an oscilloscope essentially measures voltage as a function of time. So you you've seen how you can measure voltage using the scale here. Then there's the obvious question of how do you measure time, <laughs> and you measure time with this uh, horizontal um, scale knob, or rather the that knob shows what the x scale, what the time scale is, and once you know the time scale, then you can read off the screen what the time is. So for example, let's say I want you to measure the period of this wave. I kind of know what it has to be. It's a one kilohertz wave, so its period should be about one millisecond. But let's say I didn't know that. <laughs> then, then you can actually measure the period, hence frequency, using the oscilloscope. What you do is, uh, well, I guess you first set up your oscilloscope so that you see something like one whole period. And you can, uh, you can measure the distance from peak to peak. So I measure, um, let's say, around here, that's the peak. I have one, two, three, four, um, four and, uh, let me move this a little bit so that it's a little bit easier to measure. Uh, so I'm using this uh, horizontal position knob to move this uh, left and right. Uh, there's a, so the scope has actually more range of signal than it shows, so I can do that. And um, before I go too far, let me make sure the scale is calibrated by turning this, yeah, by turning this knob all the way clockwise. That's when the scale is calibrated for sure. And yeah, so I'm gonna just turn the position knob so that the peak where of the peak where I'm starting has starts right at the division. So it starts right at division one. So two, three, four, five, a little bit short of six. So five point. I don't know, 5.8, 5.7. And so my period is 5.7 divisions, but you know, the, the unit division doesn't mean anything to anybody who's not looking at the exact oscilloscope. So you have to convert that division into seconds, and that's where you look at the snap again. It, has, it says time division is, oh, sorry, I missed the setting. This is why. Um, this is why oscilloscope is a complicated device, and you have to know what these knobs and settings do. <laughs> I just noticed this button here. Um, you can see this button in the oscilloscope manual, which I or you know the diagram from the oscilloscope manual. Um, so let me see if I can show it here. So it's the button that's labeled with the number eight, and number eight according to the manual is this one, push x5 mag. I guess that doesn't tell you anything. Um, I'll just tell you what it is. Uh, what it is is that this changes the x scale by a factor of five. That's kind of what you would have guessed. So right now, what it's showing here is something that's been changed by a factor of five. So let me undo that so that it's a normal setting so that I can just trust the numbers I see here. <laughs> so I'm going to change the setting until I see about one period again, and then we'll redo the measurement. Okay, so I'm going to put this uh, peak at the uh, first division here, and it. Uh, I really want to make it one, two, three, four, five divisions, because that would be nice. Let, let's just say it's a five division. I think this oscilloscope needs a little bit of recalibration, so... It's not exactly right, but let's say it's five divisions, it's close enough. <laughs> um, then that five division translates to period this way. Um, this knob is at the setting where this is the most the tallest bump is pointing at 0.2. Uh, I don't know if you can read that point, but you know there's the two here. So you go a little bit, so this is 0 0.2 and it's a 0 0.2 milliseconds per division. So 
five divisions, that's 0 0.5 times five, one. So it's one millisecond. The period here is one millisecond as you would have expected. So, so that's kind of it for the basic operation of an oscilloscope. It, um, it, it's, a, it's a really versatile device. It's a kind of amazing um, what kind of different things you can measure when you can measure voltage as a function of time. You can measure current. If you measure voltage across a register, that gives you something from which you can calculate the current. And it can measure other things as well. It's, uh, this is the tool of the trade for anyone doing experimental physics or circuits. Uh, if you are dealing with any kind of uh, electric or electrified measurement apparatus, there's a good chance oscilloscope can be used to, to uh, help you make a measurement. So uh, I wanted to show you some fun things too. Uh, maybe one... Um, thing that I don't want to say it's not fun, but one of the things that I was uh, talking about, which is where uh, it can, where something can be difficult to show an oscilloscope because it's too slow. And you saw a hint of that when I was changing this knob, changing this time scale. So as I went to, sl so, you know, as I'm going from here, uh, if I turn this knob counterclockwise, I'm going to the uh, I'm going to the slower time scale. That's where um, because it's uh, the, this period still remains one millisecond, but more of the period shows on the screen because I'm acquiring data for a longer time. So I'm showing a longer time scale here, and you know up until some point it's fine. But you see how this begins to flicker, and now at some point. It really begins to flicker. Um, sorry, I probably should have given you a seizure warning or something. Uh, if you are prone to seizures, look away, please. Um, I'll tell you when I'm done flickering the screen. Um, um, so yeah, and there's a reason for that. So when I'm on this setting, so it said, so right now it's flickering, so it's gonna flicker for a little bit. Um, it's at the setting of about. 10 milliseconds per division. The whole screen has 10 divisions, which means it, it takes a minimum of 0.1 second to scan the entire screen. And th this actually scans more than, uh, you know, the range scans is actually a little bit more than one whole screen. So it probably takes a little bit over 0.1 second. And at that point, it, it just, uh, um, this isn't refreshing quickly enough that you can maintain a stable image from the persistence of vision. So, so, so right now I'm just changing the scale. But imagine that the imagine that the the, the frequency of the signal that you are measuring that itself it's getting lower. So right now I'm at uh, well. So here is where it's at about hundred hertz. And at the setting I'm at, it's not showing the one whole wave. So I need to change the scale to show one whole wave and you see it begins to flicker. And if uh, this, uh, so this is at 100 Hertz. Now when it's at 10 Hertz, that's where the setting where you need it to be at in order to, to show the whole wave is where it doesn't, um, <laughs> it does that. So this is more of an um, older oscilloscope problem because, um, you know, this is not a, does it say digital oscilloscope? I don't think it does. So, so you know, it's not a digital oscilloscope, so it can't quite store the signal and take a longer time to show it. This is showing, showing the signal in real time. That's one of the reasons oscilloscope is useful. It's a kind of direct probe at the signal that you think is there. So because it shows everything so directly, that's why it's a useful experimental tool. And that also means for this non-digital version that when the signal is too slow, then it'll have difficulty showing. Um, 
so more modern <laughs> oscilloscopes, ones that are maybe a little bit more, or you know, ones that I would have to buy because this oscilloscope has been in this lab for 20, 30 years. <laughs> ones that I would have to buy for like thousand, two thousand dollars. The digital oscilloscopes, they, um, you know, they are like your computer screen. So, so those don't suffer the same problem that this oscilloscope does with the slower signal. Um, on at the other end is the problem with the signals that are too fast, and it's a kind of a general characteristic of a lot of electronic things. Let me see if I can show it to you here. So, right now my signal stuff are set up. So that, well, I guess the voltage scale, you don't really care. Um, this entire signal spans about, um, uh, it spans about uh, two divisions. That's how large the signal is. And I'm not going to mess with any of the other knobs other than the frequency knobs. So I'm going to just change the frequency range to higher, higher range. Watch what happens to the signal as I do that as I increase the frequency here to, so I'm gonna press the 50K knob, which will make this into 10 kilohertz. So 10 kilohertz, fine, it, you know, these are more tightly spaced. And this time it's not because I changed the time scale here. It's because um, the, the period really is a 0.1 millisecond instead of one millisecond. So at 10 kilohertz, nothing seems to be wrong. Let me go to 100 kilohertz. Nothing seems to be particularly wrong, but I hope you begin to see a little bit of a difference between 10 kilohertz and, or oh, maybe not with 100 kilohertz. You know, not that much yet. I mean, you can see that this is changing up and down so much that you don't see the up and down. Now, I, I can change my time scale to zoom in and just see that signal again. So right now the time scale is at 0.5 second per or 0.5 millisecond. Wait, that's not the time scale. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, this is the time scale. The time scale is at about 10, um, 10 microseconds per division or 0.1 millisecond per division. Yeah, I guess that sounds about right. Um, so one division is 10, oh, sorry, 10 microseconds is 0.01, not 0.1. So um, the period is one division here. It's a 100 kilohertz signal. So yeah, it should be about a hundredth of a millisecond. Okay, let me see if I can go higher. Um, so I think here the problem I will probably run into is not with the oscilloscope itself, but it's probably gonna be problem with the, the function generator. So when I press this five uh, megahertz button, so it's going to go from 100 kilohertz to a megahertz and see what happens. Oh, wait, nothing happened. All right, let me go a little bit higher with this knob. <laughs> see what happens as I go higher with this course knob. Does nothing interesting happen? Um, all right, never mind. So I guess with these, I can't show. Uh, it's a bummer. <laughs> uh, what I was hoping I would be able to show is that um, at higher frequencies, sometimes the signal um, gets smaller. Um, most uh, electronic things have a high frequency roll off. So uh, five megahertz is a pretty high frequency. It's getting to be at radio frequency range. And um, and so so this function, this oscilloscope can measure up to about, it can uh, see signals up to about 20 megahertz. If you try to put in signals that are like 100 megahertz, a gigahertz, microwave frequency, then, um, then you will begin to see this signal get smaller, smaller than it actually is. That's the high frequency roll off. But I, I don't think I can show that here. So <laughs> let me just go back to my, trusty one kilohertz signal that, uh, or uh, let me just uh, put the knobs at 12 o'clock position. That's gonna give me 20 kilohertz, that, yeah, that's fine. Uh, or 2.8 kilohertz, that's fine. So let me put this in here. Actually, do I want it to be higher? I think I might go a little bit higher later. 
but I'll do that later. Okay, somewhere around here, that's a reasonable range to show. So, um, the what I want to do now is a bit of an interesting thing with the two function generators. Now, what's the best way to do it? Um, I, I think the best way to uh, use the most of the screen space as I can is to stack up everything on top of each other. I think that all um, within the, the kind of screen real estate I have, I think that will give me the most. So, so I'm when I finish the adjusting this camera, I'm gonna bring the other function generator and stack it on top of the uh, top of the other one. Okay. So let me put this up here. I think you can see most of it. Um, you can at least see the numbers. I think that's enough. So, um, so I'm already putting one signal into channel one. Let me put in uh, the other signal into channel two. So let's see here. And just in case I need uh, to split the signal, I'm still using this uh, uh, T to um, split the signal. I don't have to use it. I can just connect it directly. But this is useful if I want to monitor the signal at the oscilloscope and use this other parallel connection to uh, put the signal into a circuit. Because right now I'm not dealing with any circuit, I'm just uh, showing the signal. So, yeah. So these two are at fairly similar frequencies. I think uh, that's what I wanted because that'll help me show something. Ow, ow. So let's see here. Um, let me. Oh, uh, I'm gonna get rid of DC offset in the first signal. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess they are at different voltage settings. I'm gonna put both channels at the same voltage setting, five volts per division. All right. Um, that seems reasonable. And. I suspect I have some triggering issue. That's why the signal is a bit wonky. Um, the thing I usually do is I I put this at uh, normal triggering. That kind of that makes sure that uh, the oscilloscope will trigger consistently or trigger in a uh, kind of trigger well trigger in a consistent way. Or when you can't do that, you won't trigger at all. So let me put that right now. It's on auto. Auto um, usually makes it so that it uh, triggers more easily, so that you see some signal. I prefer to have it on an auto, so that well, okay, it didn't help. <laughs> the other thing to mess with is this level here. Uh, you want the level to be where it's gonna be triggering. Um, uh, uh let me see here. Is the coupling? Do I want to trigger off of B instead? That might be what I want to do. Um yeah, I, I don't know. Internal looks so confused. So so the B signal it's triggering off of it's the channel B. That's why when I make the channel be ground, or, or let me change the output level here. You can see that the stable signal is the signal I'm triggering from. That's why it's stable, it's not moving at all. The other signal, the signal from here, it's uh, moving. And that's because uh, these two are at slightly different frequency. Let me see if I can set it so that it stops moving. Uh, I'm gonna make this signal a bit larger, just because. Um, and uh, I need to change the frequency here. And I think by carefully making this frequency the same as the other one, I can stop the signal from moving around so much. All right, kinda. I mean, it still moves around a little bit. 
Okay, now it moves the other way. <laughs> this is actually one of the ways you can measure frequency. So this would be the reference frequency and uh, how the other signal moves. That tells me how close I am to the reference frequency. And um, one of the physical phenomena we use for that is bit. And that's what I wanted to demonstrate here. So for me to demonstrate bit, I need these two signals to be about the same size. That'll help me do that. So let me make this signal a little bit larger. OK, so they are about the same size, the signal. And um, to observe a bit, you have to add the two signals together. Let me see what happens at this scale if I do that. Uh, so the uh, frequency difference between these two is probably about a less than a hertz. So well, let, let me try it. So I'm going to add the, <laughs> yeah, th these two function generators are not super stable. So I think as these change a little bit, it changes a little bit which, which frequency is higher. Um, well, let me try adding them, see what I get, and I'll adjust it if I need to. Yeah. So that's kind of what a bit is. Uh, that, that's a little bit too large. Let me make uh, reduce the amplitude of both of them to about two divisions. Uh, actually, I need to make sure they're grounded. Or, you know, the ground is about zero volt. And I can't, can I put this on ground? Yeah, OK. Um, Okay, and uh, let me reduce this as well so that uh, they are about the same size. Okay, so right now they are at the setting where I've made their frequencies as close as possible within the stability of each function generator anyway. Um, and okay, <laughs> and um, when I add the two signals together, it does this. Um, it kind of wobbles. That's a, when it's a sound that you can kind of hear it as a wobbling sound. Um, usually, when you represent a bit uh, visually, it, uh, it, it's uh, it, it's more striking when you are um, looking at it at a longer time scale so that you don't really see the carrier frequency. Here, the 2.4 kilohertz would be the carrier frequency. Uh, let me make the frequency difference between them a little bit larger. Uh, okay, so this will put the bit frequency at about, I think a fraction of a, or a little bit higher than one hertz. So the bit period is a fraction of a second. So at this time scale, all you're seeing is this blinking thing. Once again, that's a little bit, um, seizure inducing. <laughs> so let me zoom out. When I zoom out, this is what I hope you will see. Um, yeah, it's not super stable. So you'll kind of squint through that blinking thing. Um, you see that envelope thing, right? Envelope of, um, yeah, envelope thing. That's a, um, th that's a bit. And I think, so in this setting, I can't really stabilize the image because for the bit signal, there's nothing I can trigger off of. I'm triggering off of one of the two carrier frequencies and um, it, it just won't be stable with respect to where the zeros in the bits are. So, um, so that's one thing you can do. You can use, oscill uh, use oscilloscope to add signals and, one of the easy things you can do by adding signal is um, you can you can demonstrate bit and you know even without adding signal you can use this to compare frequencies or try to set the frequency of one function generator as close as possible to the other reference function generator and uh, this is probably more precise than looking at the numbers because these digital scales they flicker a little bit. So, so that's uh, one thing I can demonstrate with oscilloscope. I want you to demonstrate one more thing, which is uh, 
It's a special mode of oscilloscope. I don't know how well you can read it. Uh, let me look at my zoom screen to see if I can read it. Uh, yeah, you can't really. Let me do it this way. I think I can show it to you on the the picture from the manual. So, um, so this is the picture from the manual. Let me zoom in to the portion of the manual that uh, <laughs> I want you to see. When you look at this time knob, huh, it doesn't show that. <laughs> I guess I, maybe I should have looked. Why doesn't it show? Uh, let me see what it says about number nine. Uh, where the number nine is? So if time, okay, that's not it. <sighs> All right, I'll, I'll, let me just zoom in with the camera. Um, so. <laughs> So zooming in with the camera. Um, I think if I zoom in closely enough, you can see it better. And I'll zoom back out so that you can see this. Um, it's a, a thing that uh, I think almost every oscilloscope has it. I'm kind of surprised that the manual doesn't have that label there. So, oops. My finger. So when you look at the time now, sorry, let me move the camera. It's a, kind of at a bad uh, perspective. It's not okay. Um, That the highest of quality is tripod here. Okay, so when you look at the time now, so now you can see all those tiny letters in the different scales. It has millisecond and the uh, uh, microsecond time scales. And when you turn this knob all the way, there's a special mode that's labeled XY. That XY mode is the um, it's the mode where the x-axis is not used for time. It's uh, it's used as one of the axes. It's I think the closest analogy is probably the parametric plotting. Imagine the signal that's coming. So uh, let me show it to you here. So the channels A and B have an alternate label, or at least I think they are too. Um, there's a possibility that they don't. Actually, I don't think these do. So let me not really show that uh, since they don't. <laughs> let me zoom out. Um, so you can imagine the signals that are going into channels A and B as being a function of T, parameter T. And I think this gets covered in a pre-calculus maybe. Um, and uh, you can, you can cop, you can plot things uh, parametrically, as in you have a function that uh, traces out the uh, positions along x, another function that traces out a position along y, and both the functions depend on the same parameter t. And um, so I think people here have seen parametric plotting. Uh, if you haven't, let me know in the chat. Um, so. So you can do that here. Uh, you can use the oscilloscope to plot parametrically. Let me just uh, finish fixing this down and then I'll show some uh, parametric plots you can do. Some of the more fun ones you can do with these oscilloscope and function generators. That's probably about right. Okay, uh, I moved the camera. Hopefully this view is still relatively okay. Um, so so, uh, so I'm gonna turn this knob all the way uh, to the most clockwise, most clockwise position that's going to put me on that X, Y mode. Let's see what we get. So yeah, that's what we get on X, Y mode. 
um, some kind of ellipse that um, moves around. Uh, let me see if I can demonstrate some of the parameters here. So the channel A, which is the signal from this one, that should be my x-axis. Let me change the output level here and see. Um, that's my y-axis. OK, so <laughs> signal A is the y-axis. <laughs> this is why we test. Sometimes different devices do different things. And the so signal B, the thing that's going to channel B, should be my x-axis. So when I change this, then yeah, then it. So yeah, so that's um, what it looks like. And um, And I guess um, <laughs> right now you see the shape kind of changing. And um, so when you have two function generators, it's uh, just going to be impossible to keep that stable because you can, you know, do uh, your best to, to make these to the same frequency. And when they are the exact same frequency, they are supposed to be the same. Um, maybe it's easier to do at lower frequency. So let me try doing it at lower frequency. So I'm going to bring this down to about uh, yeah, about 200 hertz. So they are different by quite a bit. That's why you see that very <laughs> um, square-like thing that Got a lot of other lines inside. Let me uh, bring these two frequencies to be closer to each other. Uh, wait, I ran out of range here. Actually, uh, can do that. Yeah. So, so at this point, I'm not looking at the numbers, but rather I'm looking at the shape to see if I can get it to be stable as I move this now. OK, kind of stable-ish. <laughs> and that's when their frequencies are the same. And or the same as I can get it to be. Um, and let's see what more can I demonstrate with this. I thought um, if you double the frequency, you got something interesting. Um, let me try that. So it's going to be a little bit hard to do it by hand, but um, but I so you know when these frequencies are different by arbitrary amount, you get that. But when it's at double the frequency, there should be a, I don't know what the right word is, harmonic. Uh, there should be something interesting that shows up that, again, kind of looks like a stable image. And that's a result of um, the two having something, some kind of a stable phase relationship. So I'm almost there. Uh, so I need to be this to be about 440. Okay, around there. Oh, yeah, I guess I almost hit it by accident. So that's one. <laughs> and depending on the relative phase between them, it either looks like a figure eight, or I think it, depending on how you look at it, sometimes it, it reminds me of a, a kind of a three dimensional shape. Like I can imagine that being uh, something that's a uh, wire that's uh, around the edges of a saddle that's uh, rotating around. <laughs> um, I, I mean, you know, it's not actually 3D and nothing in there is supposed to be 3D, but the shape that's uh, changing on the screen makes sense to me if I imagine it as a saddle-shaped wire that's rotating. Um, so, so there are a lot of fun things you can do with oscilloscopes and this XY mode. And you know, you it 
So right now I'm just playing. I'm not doing anything that's functional or useful. But this effect can be used for something that's functional or useful. Uh, one, I guess the easiest example to explain is this. So let me show it to you with this. Imagine you have the two signals that are identical. Um, so I can exactly get that if I take one of these and just put it into, <laughs> into the same thing. So I have the same identical signal going into two different channels. Then, then you get that. And I hope that kind of makes a sense um, because this is basically plotting a line, y equals x. That's what it's plotting. And I mean, you know, technically x is equal to sine of omega t, and y is also equal to sine of omega t. So they are both uh, equal to each other. And the interesting thing that you get is what if there's a phase difference between these two signals? As in, one of them is a sine of omega t plus a phi, some angle. Then this shape starts to look a little bit different. So I can simulate that a little bit using two function generators. Once again, it's not going to be perfect because it's just not possible to have these two frequencies to be exactly the same. But let me try to get them as the same as possible. Uh. So as you look at this shape, and I get there. So the measure of when these two signals at the exact same frequency is not whether it's a perfect circle. That actually doesn't tell you that. They are at the exact same frequency when they are when the, this picture is stable. And I just can't get there, so I'll just leave that be. <laughs> and, um, so because they are not the exact same frequency, you see the shape changing over time. And when the shape looks like a line, or looks like a line, that's when uh, these two signals are at the same phase. So they kind of look like sine of omega t, both of them. And when this shape looks like a circle, is when they are out of phase by 90 degrees. Uh, one is a sine, the other is cosine. And when they are at the line the, going the other way, that's when they're out of phase by 180 degrees. And, um, and you can... You can actually see that in the signals themselves. If I put this out of the XY mode and go back to the normal time mode, that's kind of what you see here. You know, the so I'm right now triggering off of this signal. So uh, the signal I'm triggering off of remains stable, but the other signal is kind of moving. So when it's here, they're the same phase. When they are here, they are 180 degree out of phase, and so on. And um, and you know you can definitely measure that on this screen. You know that that's doable. In fact, you know trying to set the frequency is exactly the same. You can do that on this screen as well. Uh, oh, can I get it stable enough? I think they, no. It's, yeah, yeah. They they just want stay stay stable enough. <laughs> um, so you can see it here as well. Uh, the benefit of the XY mode is it allows you to just uh, focus on, let's say, the phase relationship. The parameter that you use to trace this out, time, it it um, it doesn't show here, so it uh, allows you to make measurements that's more, in some sense, more direct and not potentially confused with other um, parameters that, especially if you are not interested in the parameter for the particular measurement for whatever reason. Um, okay, let me see if there's some exercise from the um, exercise from the the uh, lamp manual that I can do. Uh, what I let me move this off to over here. I guess it's okay if it's uh, hiding my face. Um, so I did some aspects of this. Um, 
kind of playing with oscilloscope and setting um, whatever frequency it's at. Um, oh, oh, I guess I said I would uh, uh, go over this. Um, so let's do that. I think um, if I put it on the screen, um, so I hope everyone can read the numbers. For example, um, let me know if you can read this. That says 29. Uh, let me know in the chat. I think I can still, oh wait, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I wasn't able to see the chat before. Now I see the chat. Um, <laughs> I see uh, some private messages from earlier. Uh, let me just read it and uh, address it as best as I can. It says, when would you use the X5 Mac? Um, that's a very good question. I will get to that in a bit. When the oscilloscope starts fully occurring at 10 millisecond per division, why does the knob show more options? Um, does it show more options? Uh, does it stop fully occurring if the function has a lower frequency? Yeah. Um, okay, so I see a lot of questions. Let me just address it in order. So. The X5 Mac, um, you know, I, I frankly think it's an advertising thing. Um, so let me go back to the other screen where you can see all this. The reason I think it's an advertising thing is you can kind of see it here. Let me go back to just the one signal, signal A, that I'm going to trigger off of. Um, and... Let me set this at, I don't know, um, highest the frequency I can get to, 5 megahertz. And, or let me actually go to 5 megahertz. Oh, not actually 5. Uh, let me go to 4 megahertz. So, wait, 4 It's fine either way. Now, let me go all the way to 5 megahertz. I think that's where, so, you know, 5.3 megahertz. And... When I turn this uh, time uh, scale knob, this is what you see. So at the position just before X, Y mode, at this position here, it's barely showing this uh, 5 megahertz signal, not even so that that's one whole cycle um, shown on the screen, but it's more than one cycle. So um, so you, it's a very reasonable question to ask. If a signal looks like this at 5 megahertz, what is 20 megahertz going to look like? You know, it's gonna be four times as more squished. So how is this uh, 20 megahertz uh, oscilloscope if uh, this is how it's showing five megahertz signal? It's because of this X5 Mac, because when you press that, now it shows that. Now you can imagine <laughs> if you uh, squish it by factor of four, that's still a reasonable signal. So, um, so that's a uh, um, yeah. So I think that X5 mag button that's really there for um, advertising reasons. I, I so this X5 mag it doesn't the signal quality isn't any better. It just stretched out more. But um, so you wouldn't want to be using it most of the time. But when especially when you're at the high frequency limit, you have hit the limit on where you can get to with this time now then uh, this button allows you to reach a little bit beyond um, what. And you can kind of see it here. When you look at the highest knob, I'll just read the number. It says 0.2 microsecond. And the, the frequency scale that matches to 0.2 microsecond per division. So one division representing period of 0.2 microsecond, that's, uh, what? Oh, <laughs> that's 5 megahertz. <laughs> um, so, so it's with this X5 button that you can that justifies this being a 20 megahertz, not five megahertz or four megahertz oscilloscope. So marketing, um, I, I, you know, in the lab I used to work with a hundred megahertz oscilloscopes, proper hundred megahertz. They didn't have this X5 mag button. It's not a common thing. It's a marketing thing. It's like a turbo button on one of those old desktop computers. It's like. Why isn't it always on? <laughs> it's one of those things where, yeah. And the uh, oscilloscope flickering, it has entirely only to do the, with the time setting. 
So I'm pretty sure it always will start start fully occurring at around, let's see here. Yeah, so here it doesn't, here at one millisecond per division, it doesn't fully occur. And here at two milliseconds per division, it begins to fully occur. And I think the fully occur is even more noticeable uh, on the, on your on the computer screen because of the aliasing effect, um, and you know it doesn't matter because the time scale here sets the scan rate, and that scan rate is what forces it to flicker. So regardless of uh, what kind of signal is being input, it doesn't affect the flicker. It just uh, it's a question of if you can actually see the signal, and. I, I don't think I understand the other question. Why does the NAP show more options? Um, you mean like options like the ones where it's definitely flickering? Um, so assuming that's what the question was, well, you know, you can do useful measurements at that scale. Like imagine you have a, uh, yeah, you may imagine you have a five hertz signal. And this is the setting you would be at to display that five hertz signal. And I think in the era when this uh, was produced, you could probably do something like a, a, a long exposure photography to uh, take a picture of this. Um, there is like an oscilloscope camera that's uh, meant to be attached to this to take an actual camera of this screen, uh, I mean, photo of the screen. And um, if, if you do a long exposure, you can get a useful picture out of even something like this. It's just that, you know, in the in-lab setting, when you're just uh, looking at it, this is uh, really annoying to look at. So we try to stay away from it. But uh, these uh, longer time scale options, they are useful. They, um, they are not useless. Um, and I guess the, the other reason that they would include it is, again, for marketing reason, as in uh, they can say that they have all these options and including those low frequency options, it doesn't actually cost them that much money in terms of the component quality values that goes into it. It's an easy thing to include, so they include it. And you know, there are circumstances where you would use it. So um, the question of how does oscilloscope work, um, you know, I actually have a demonstration device. Since this is a meeting about oscilloscope, let me bring out the uh, the demonstration device. So um, I'm going to move the camcorder so that you can see this a little bit better. I hope I have enough of a room. Uh, let me move the camera to show the front of the demonstration oscilloscope. Let me make sure it turns on, and I will um, and I will show more once I confirm that it turns on. It's been uh, well about a year since I've used it. That's why I'm not hundred percent sure if it will turn on. All right, something turned on. Um, Let's see here. Uh, intensity is a minimum. Oh, no, no, there it is. Yeah, so this is a kind of an oscilloscope. It, I hope it uh, reminds you of the other oscilloscope you've seen. And yeah, okay, let me turn down the intensity a little bit. Uh, focus, let's see. All right, that's probably okay, focus. So, let me uh, take this camera off the tripod so that I can move it around and show. And I think I have enough of the cable length to do that, I think. So, you know, the front of the screen, this is just like any other oscilloscope. It's a demonstration oscilloscope because it's uh, made out of transparent components. So this, uh, Things on the bottom, they are just the electronic control things. These are, um, I guess, not the parts that are um, central to the operation of oscilloscope. The things that are central to the operation of the oscilloscope is in this tube. 
you actually can't see most of it. Um, what you can see is the um, this portion here. This is the portion that produces the electron beam and the and the devices you see here is that's what controls the electron beam and the the voltage that's being input into the oscilloscope it gets applied to these plates that's what steers the electron beam up and down and that's how the voltage so in the traditional oscilloscope not the more fancy modern digital oscilloscope it's uh, the voltage that uh, applied to those parallel plates is how electron beams get steered up or down. And that's, uh, that's how the voltage signal that you put in gets uh, translated into signal that's uh, displayed here. So um, let's see. I'm trying to find. Um, I see vertical deflection. I, I'm just looking at this here. A vertical deflection, internal, external, horizontal deflection. Um, if it's internal, where are my knots? Um, oh. Um, Okay, that's doing something. Sorry, uh, let me put this back on the tripod. So I'm not. Um, I I can just uh, demonstrate the electron beam in one way, uh, which is with the magnet magnets that I have. I can just uh, show that it uh, the beam behaves the way you'd expect it to behave. Um, but one thing I wanted to try was. When it's on the internal knob, um, I guess there is no way to control the internal knob, uh, internal signal. So if I put both the vertical and horizontal deflection to external, right, then uh, this uh, display just in a dot. Oh, you know, I think I can actually use this like an uh, uh, XY mode of the, the other oscilloscope. It's uh, these plugs here that will um, that will connect to this uh, connection connector here, and I can put both of them on external and control both of the vertical deflection and the horizontal deflection with the signal from the function generators. Oops, the, the other one hits the wrong connector. I'm gonna replace there with the one that's the right connection. And and um, so in an oscilloscope, the there's a, a internal circuit that controls the horizontal deflection on the on a timer. That's what generates that. Uh, that that's what generates that uh, the horizontal sweep, uh, and this one can do that too. If I put the horizontal deflection to internal, that oh, I guess <laughs> it's supposed to be oriented this way. <laughs> Yeah. So, so, so now the horizontal deflection is internal. It looks horizontal. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess that this was supposed to be looked at just to demonstrate. So, uh, I'm used to setting it up the other way so that it doesn't fall over. <laughs> so, uh, so when it's on internal, it's just a sweeping uh, back and forth and that's uh, producing the horizontal line. And when I put the vertical deflection on to internal as well, then it's getting that kind of diagonal line, the same thing as what you saw with the XY mode before. Let me make the intensity a little bit higher. So um, what, I can, what I can do with this uh, oscilloscope as well is I can put the signal from this um, from these function generators. 
and use that to control it. And I can get the same picture that was seen earlier. Uh, so this is the uh, lower function generator, which let me change the frequency so that it's uh, similar to what it was before. Uh, now the frequency for the lower one reads about 200 hertz. So this is the line for 200 hertz. Let me put that into the uh, put that into the. Uh, let me have it going to the. Let me put it have it going to the uh, vertical so that it's uh, um, uh, going into the y-axis as before, and. Oh, wow. You need a quite a bit of voltage to drive that. So what you're seeing here is the, the range of the, the voltage. So I'm going to increase the voltage amplitude on the function generator, and that'll go up a little bit higher. But not much higher. <laughs> I guess the, this was designed for a much. So this is going from something like plus minus 10 volt and that's all that's showing. And if I put this other one in, I think it's gonna, yeah, that's just tiny. You can barely see it on video. Um, let me just make that into the maximum amplitude. And, and I can do the same thing that, let me just put this a little bit closer. I, I can do the same thing that I did with the, the other oscilloscope before I can. Adjust this until the frequencies are exactly matched. And when they are exactly matched, then the, I see a stable shape here. So um, let me. Um, so the oscilloscopy, uh, it, sometimes it, this kind of tube used to be called, well, it is still called the cathode ray tube. And the reason for that is this is an electron beam hitting a screen that has a fluorescent material in it. And the operation principle of oscilloscope is in controlling that electron beam using voltages. And so using voltages to sweep the sweep it in the horizontal direction or display the applied voltage signal in the y direction. That's how it works. So one way you can affect an electron beam is with magnets. So I want to be careful here because there's always possibility of permanently magnetizing something and screwing up the oscilloscope. But let me bring one of my neodymium magnets and move this beam around. I have this. Um, so let me not use my strongest neodymium magnet. I'm using these, uh, which are my weaker of the neodymium magnets, and using this, I can um, I can mess with that picture. You can always kind of see it as I move this around, even at this distance, it's moving the thing around. <laughs> so uh, I don't. The thing is, I don't know which end of these are north and south poles. Uh, let me just uh, move this out a little bit so that you can see my hand with the magnet. And just move it around a little bit. So, um, well, let's see if I can figure out which end is the North Pole. Let me look at this end here. And if this is North Pole, as I bring the magnet from above down, what it should do is magnetic field points down. So if uh, I have electrons, coming out this way. So, you know, imagine doing V cross V, V uh, going into the camera, uh, B going down. So V cross B points to the, uh, points to right from your view. And uh, since the electrons are negative, that would mean um, the force points to the left. So that's what would be the case if this is the North Pole. Let's see if that happens. If that doesn't happen, then this means it, that means it's south pole. So from above, it's pushing that to the right. So that must mean this is the south pole. So this is the north pole. Um, 
So if it, if now this end is not full, meaning if I bring this in from the uh, from the left, then uh, so if we cross uh, B the if we cross B points up. So for electron force should be pointing down. Let's see if that's what happens. If we cross B, yeah, it's going down. So so it's an electron beam that I can control with a magnet. And I don't know if uh, I can push it away entirely. Um, yeah, I don't think I can quite push it away entirely. Um, let me try with a stronger magnet. At the risk of breaking that, let me get a stronger neodymium magnet. This is one of my, oh, this is one of my super strong neodymium magnet. It's bigger, so it's stronger. Let me see if I can push it away entirely. Uh, kinda, maybe. <laughs> I don't know if you can see it from there. Let me move the camera closer. <laughs> so, um, so it. it uh, uh, I think I showed this uh, uh, at the last time we had online lab uh, with the e, e, the charge to mass uh, apparatus, where you can actually see the beam. Here, the challenge is that you can't see the beam. You can only see when the electrons are striking the screen. Uh, what I can do with this magnet is I can um, make the electrons spiral, repel it away. So as I move this closer, you can kind of see that. It's distorting, distorting, and there's a point where it's uh, um, basically pushing it away. So I don't know, it's uh, getting to a point, and I guess I wish I could make it so that there's no point at all, but uh, there might be. And the both ends of it, the magnet kind of does it the same way. The way it spirals is different, uh, different direction. But uh, so, anyways, I think that's probably enough of a, a demo with uh, this uh, demonstration of oscilloscope. Uh, so it's a cathode ray tube. That's uh, that's uh, how it works. Um, that you apply the voltages here to uh, control where the electron beam strikes at the screen, and uh, the, the rest are in the precision electronics that go into it. Let's see how well this would work. Um, yeah, I think the way this would work is I would need to move the camera, I think. So let me just leave this here, and we'll just go through each uh, each thing one by one. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to put in some signal to the oscilloscope so that it has some predictable behavior. Just gonna put in one signal to channel A, and um, and let's see. What that looks like. Uh, let me set it to some. So th this is a typical oscilloscope picture. Uh, this is what an oscilloscope should look like, kinda. And um, what I would do is now uh, just to zoom in. Uh, you know, so this uh, manual it lists uh, uh, what's the highest number? It lists uh, 29 different things number 29, and we'll just uh, start at number one and just work our way through each one of those. Um, some of those are really simple things. So, oops. really in an awkward position for operating this camera. Um, okay, so, what the lamp manual labels as number one is the the input A. So mm, it's all blurry. Okay, I guess autofocus has some range limit. Um, so what it's labeling as a number one, that's number one, vertical input, or it's technically vertical input A, and See, what does it say? Yeah, 
And number one here is the, it serves the same function as number 27. That's why when you look at the list above, number one and number 27 both say vertical input. Well, it's vertical inputs A and B. So that's one and 27. Uh, number two is this knob here. They call it ACGNDDC. Well, it's the coupling mode uh, button. It switches between DC, um, so it switches between, uh, let me zoom out a little bit so that you can see how the signal changes. Uh, let me, I'm going to put in a little bit of a vertical offset to the signal so that you can see when it changes from DC to AC mode. So right now there's a bit of a vertical offset. And so in DC is where it's the signal as it's being put, GND, that's no signal at all. Uh, I mean, auto trigger. It's no signal at all. It's just the horizontal line at zero volt, or it indicates where zero volt is. And AC is where the oscilloscope tries to remove DC offset. So when you average over the whole signal, you should get zero. So when it's a, a distorted signal, when it's asymmetric like that, then, um, then you know, it, the, the kind of peak to trough uh, middle point is different from where it averages zero. Anyway, so the, the number two is the, that mode uh, determined, it's the, that switch. I guess the manual isn't really giving you the proper names. Three. Um, oh yeah, it's uh, the three is the mode that uh, matters for multi-channel. It's uh, does it really just label it mode? Like uh, uh, you know, I don't know if there's an actual name for it. For so let me not be too critical about that. Not giving your name. Uh, but the number three is referring to our these it decides how these channels are display. Right now, I only have A pressed in because I'm just uh, displaying channel A. If I have something hooked to, to channel B, I might want to display channel B too, or I think I can display now, and that's what's showing right now because I have nothing to B. And um, when you have uh, both of them on, then you can use this additional button to display the sum of the two signals. Right now, when I do that, nothing interesting because B is just zero. I'm just adding zero. But you saw it earlier with the you saw it earlier with the other um, the, the two sine wave signals. How adding the two signals can show you a bit uh, interference phenomena. So so that's a three. Number four, I think, uh, volts per division variable. So it's you have to kind of look at where the arrow's going. I'm oh, sorry. Number four, when you look at where the arrow's going, it's going to the center there. So it's uh, uh, pointing you to this. Uh, uh, it's pointing you to this. Uh, the, so this is actually two knobs in one, the center knob and the outer knob. The center knob is the one that changes the scale. So. Uh, when the center knob is at anywhere but the most clockwise position, you can't really use the the, the calibration because the the center knob changes the it makes it a the volts per division variable. <laughs> and number five is referring to this volts per division that actually sets the calibrated volts per division that you can use to measure uh, how many volts of signal you have. Um, Number six is, uh, that's the vertical position knob. That's uh, this knob here that um, that I can use to move the signal up or down. I like this camera view. So it's the chip tripod I have. I have a real way to smoothly change the views. Um, so with this vertical position knob, I can move the signal up or down. Well, when I do that, I'm not actually changing the signal. I usually do this when this is on ground. That lets me set where the zero volts are in the middle, if I want it to be in the middle. So, so that's number six, position now. And I think, yeah, the, they also have the identical label for uh, number 23. So 23, it also says, oh, channel B position. Yeah, so there'll be channel B position. 
Um, number seven is that's the horizontal position knob. So that would be this knob here. Uh, so on the horizontal scale, when you move this knob, um, it it changes the horizontal position of the signal. So. Um, so as I turn this, it moves the signal to the left and right. And how you can actually, there's two different ways you can move the signal. So you can move the signal horizontally by, by turning this knob. You can also move the signal horizontally by, let's see, controlling number 13, which is the triggering level. So when I change this triggering level, let me zoom out a little bit more. So, um, so this is the triggering level, triggering level now. When I turn it, you will see the signal move a little bit horizontally. So when I turn this, uh, let's see here. Yeah, you see the signal moving <laughs> horizontally a little bit and then flickering. Um, and how this signal move is moving is different. Uh, let me do it this way. So. I'm gonna put the screen here so that you can see the entire oscilloscope screen. And first, I'm going to move this signal by changing the position now. So I'm right now turning the number seven position now to move the signals a little bit to the right. And you see that signal is cut off on the left hand. That's uh, because that's where the signal starts. Oscilloscope doesn't have any more to show beyond the to the left of that. And now let me change the level knob. I'm turning the number 13, the level knob, uh, counterclockwise. And you can see that as I do that, what it's, uh, what it's, uh, let me just, no. what it's really doing is, uh, you know, until it stops doing, it's changing where it's triggering the signal. So when the triggering level is lower, then, then it, um, then you know it, it's basically triggering a little bit earlier in the signal itself. So uh, let me jump ahead a little bit and press on uh, number 15. That's the slope now. That'll, so right now it's uh, triggering on the upward slope. I can have a trigger on the downward slope. So when I press that button, it now triggers on the downward slope. And as I turn this triggering knob clockwise, you can see it triggering a little bit earlier until you know it kind of goes above. Tr when the trigger level goes above the signal level, then it doesn't trigger anymore. I put the mode, mode on norm so that it does that. It only triggers when the level is actually crossed. So, so and that the effect of that is it also moves the signal a little bit left and right, but that's a, kind of in a complicated way. If you just want to move the signal left to right, you Move, move, use the knob number seven, the position knob. That's what you use to just move the signal without um, dealing anything with the signal itself. Okay, knob number eight. Oh, that's uh, the uh, X5 uh, mag. And I think we <laughs> spent enough time with that X5 mag. Um, so, you know, that one's uh, a bit specific to this uh, oscilloscope. And my suspicion, as I said, I think it's there for marketing reasons. It's not something that's inherent in an operation of a, an oscilloscope that it must have an X5 uh, mag button. No, <laughs> that's not a thing. This one just has it so that it can claim to be a 20 megahertz oscilloscope while most of the time working like a four megahertz oscilloscope. Uh, number nine, I feel like I did number nine. Oh, uh, we talked about number nine when we did the uh, the so it, when I was trying to look for the X Y thing on the manual, which I guess it doesn't have, but um, this is this is number nine, the the time knob that's really all it is, and when it focuses, will it focus? Oh, hold on. Let me just move. Sorry, the camcorder I'm using doesn't have a very good uh, optics. It doesn't. Oh, you really can't focus at close distance. Uh, 
All right. The zoom is also very. Uh, all right. I'll just zoom out a little. So, yeah, that that's the time scale. Um, you turn it to uh, to so that the signal that you're looking at looks like uh, how you should. Uh, want it to look like, and the highest end of the time scale usually indicates the speed of the oscilloscope. Um, and this is the XY mode that you saw me play with earlier. So that's number nine. And I think there should be a, is it number 10? Yeah, number 10 is the sweep time variable. So this is another knob that comes in two parts. The, the inner knob is the one that makes the time variable, but on this oscilloscope, I think it's a little bit funky. Uh, but yeah, I usually don't mess with the inner knob. I just uh, want, always want to make sure it's uh, turned all the way clockwise so that whatever scale I'm looking at is calibrated. I usually don't mess with it. Um, so I'm looking at number 11, oh, external trigger. External trigger. Um, oh, oh, so it's a, this is input that you, haven't seen me use, and I guess I won't be using it ever in this class because I don't need to. Um, so you saw how sometimes the the sometimes the trigger that I get is rather unreliable. Like right now here, I'm triggering on the internal signal. So this is what it means when you are triggering on the internal signal. So let's say I'm going to reduce the signal a little bit, or I'm going to reduce it a lot. As I reduce the signal, what you see happen is that at some point the trigger goes away and it doesn't trigger. Or if the trigger is on auto mode, then it triggers in this unreliable way. And sometimes you want to avoid that even when you have, um, even when you, so even when your signal goes away, you still want to continue triggering reliably. Then what you can do is you can, uh, you can put a, another signal into an external trigger. And actually, I guess I can do that now. Let me use the T on the, the function generator. So, um, yeah, it, it's the same. Hey, can I? Let me give that a try and see if it works or not. <laughs> if it doesn't work, I'll just move on. Um, usually, we, oh, wait, wait, I can do this. Um, so on the function generator, you let me just explain the input I'm using on the function generator. It's got more than one input, and one of the inputs is um, yeah one the one of the two inputs that or I guess one of them is uh, actually an input. Uh, you are putting you are supposed to put signal into this one. This is an output. It's one of the outputs that I haven't used yet, and I can get it to focus. Um, it's labeled a TTL, and it puts out a kind of signal that's uh, ideal for using for triggering. It's a square wave signal that's, um, you know, it has some specification like five volts on off or something. And so it's a really good to use as a triggering signal. So I'm gonna uh, put a, a signal from there to the external uh, trigger thingy. So put this into external trigger. And when I uh, put my trigger source to the external, now this it should trigger reliably. OK, <laughs> I changed the level a little bit. So now it triggers reliably, and it does uh, regardless of what the signal is. I can make the signal super small, and it'll continue to trigger reliably because the signal it's triggering from is not the the signal that it's displaying, so and so it's just super reliable that way. So so you can use so that's the external uh, trigger input. That's a number. External trigger input. Uh, that's number eleven. Uh, number twelve. Cal. Where's number twelve? Um, I'm having trouble finding number 12. <laughs> and I see 11. Ah, there it is, 12. Cal, huh? what? Um, 
you know what? I'm gonna assume that with the cal thing. Um, so I have never used it. So it's referring to this thing. It's not a button at all, but it's a. Uh, what it looks like is it's an an electrical connection. It's a, a wire thing that you can connect it to, and under it it says 0.5 volt. So if I had to guess. What it is probably is, is it's probably supposed to output a 0.5 volt. And <laughs> this is what I would recommend that you do. Uh, where I link to the, the thing, I actually give you the, the oscilloscope manual. This is the oscilloscope manual. And I'm nearly 100% sure that this manual will explain how that Cal thing is used. <laughs> um, so yeah, it might be an uh, external calibration thing, or it might be displaying something. I don't know. <laughs> so this is something specific to this oscilloscope that um, you would have to read the manual to find out what it actually does. So um, OK, so that's 12. <laughs> 13, triggering level. Oh, that's what I've been playing with already before. It's uh, this knob here. It, so. So right now with the TTL signal, this level doesn't do much beyond. So um, so let me switch the view to here. When you when I turn this, it doesn't do much beyond you know whether it triggers or not. Like uh, let me put it on norm. Wait, on norm does it always? Oh wait, on norm it I get okay okay. So here it doesn't trigger at all. Here it triggers, and some air up here. I don't know what it's triggering on actually. Um, but anyways, so it um, so TTL signal is a pulse kind of signal. That's why it doesn't. There's no smooth move. You know, triggering level is never. It's not designed to be used to move the signal horizontally. If you want to move the signal horizontally, you should be using this. That's why it's set up that way. So um, so level knob. I've already been using it. Uh, push auto. Oh yeah, that's uh, this knob here. It. Uh, um, it changes between auto trigger mode and the norm trigger mode. It's uh, I, I think it's easiest to explain when I'm on the internal trigger mode. So let me switch the trigger source to internal. And I'm going to put this back out to norm. Oh, wait, it was on norm. So right now it's on norm. Uh, let me uh, show you the signal here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the trigger level. So I'm just tr turning the trigger now until something happens, okay, now it's not triggering anymore because the uh, because the, the trigger level is beyond the range of the signal. Now, when I press on the auto norm button and switch to, to auto mode, this is what it does. It still triggers. And I think a different oscilloscopes sometimes work differently. Uh, but I think the way I like to think about it that's relatively consistent across different oscilloscopes is on the auto mode, it'll almost always trigger. If uh, the oscilloscope doesn't find a good trigger signal, it'll just trigger anyway. So it's good for showing you the signal, showing you that there is some signal instead of, you know, you know something, oops, got disconnected, there's no signal at all. Uh, when it's on auto mode, it can show you that, oh, there is a signal. So you can start to troubleshoot. You can start to fiddle with the level until it shows something stable. Um, and uh, so it, auto mode is good for initially setting up the oscilloscope. Once it's all set up, I like to put it on norm so that it either triggers correctly or it doesn't trigger at all. Sometimes, um, you know, when things fail, sometimes things failing silently or failing in a kind of <laughs> subtle way is sometimes worse than when it fails very clearly. Uh, and I like things to fail very clearly when it fails. So I prefer to put it on normal mode once the, everything's set and I kind of know how it's supposed to operate. So um, yeah, so that's then knob number 14. 15 slope up, I've already been using it, the upward slope, downward slope. So right now I can kind of judge it from how the signal looks that it, uh, I guess when it's pressed in, it must be triggering on the downward slope. So when I unpress it, it now triggers on the upward slope. So um, that's what it does. <laughs> Not much explanation or. Uh, 
yeah. Uh, sometimes you prefer one versus the other. Um, 16 coupling. Um, coupling. You know, I have no idea what that is. Um, I mean, it's this. What I mean is I have no idea what it does. Uh, it might have something to do with the trigger coupling, but I don't know if I change the modes, what the, its effects are. So let me do it this way. Um, so right now it's on AC. Let me try AC-LF and then TV. Um, it's changing something. Um, I think it's a different, um, I mean, I can guess. Um, I can guess that when it's uh, on AC, it's only triggering on the, the it's a filtering out the low frequency component of the trigger signal and it's uh, ACLF. Oh, you know, it's a, uh, uh, do I want to? And TV, I think it's a triggering on, based on what's uh, shown on the screen. Uh, what I don't, yeah, let me just leave it there. Um, don't know. This was on AC and, a, and AC seems to work fine. So I'll just leave it at AC <laughs> or AC to CLF. You know, I think AC yeah, I don't know. Let me just leave it on AC. <laughs> uh, I, I will have to say the the different trigger coupling modes, it's not something that I've had to deal with a lot. Um, usually I, this is one of those switches that I flip it around to see if it works better and then I leave it on whatever setting seems to work. I don't worry too much of which setting is more ideal. If it seems to work, then it works. Uh, 17 GND. Why is it labeling 17 GND? Uh, oh, um, so 17 is referring to this. It's not a knob or control anything, it's the ground. So it's something to actually it's something to know about for, uh, for, sorry. it's something to know about um, apparatus like oscilloscope and function generator is, and I mentioned this when I was using the power supply for the, um, for the circuits demo. It, uh, it's whether it's grounded or not. And the thing to be aware of oscilloscope is that it's a grounded instrument, as in, um, so, so let, let me kind of change the, so <laughs> let me have a little bit of a visual, uh, visual thing to point to here. So uh, I have these cables. Uh, so this is a coaxial to this alligator click cable the, the black is ground, red is the, the inside, the signal wire. And imagine I have uh, this kind of cable connected to both the channel B and uh, channel A. Oh, it's gonna disconnect the signal, but that's fine. So it's something to be aware of, uh, probably not in this class, but if you do any kind of circuit analysis, something to be aware of. So when you have these two set of leads for oscilloscope, um, the the signal leads, they are not, there's nothing that connects the two together. They're just the separate. And so you use these to measure voltage. These ground leads, even when they are not explicitly connected to each other, they are connected through internally through the oscilloscope. There is, um, so there are, all, both of these black leads are connected to the ground, which means internally through the oscilloscope, they are connected. So sometimes you can accidentally uh, short the different parts of the circuit. If uh, you place this one black lead on one part of the circuit and the other black lead on another part of the circuit, then, um, then those two parts end up being connected uh, through very low resistance path. Uh, through the ground of the oscilloscope, so um, so so that's something to be aware of for about the property of oscilloscope and any instrument that you deal with, you should know if it's a, a grounded instrument 
or if it's uh, if it's not grounded. And because the oscilloscope is grounded, it can actually provide this ground here. So this is uh, one of the places where you can just connect a wire to, to connect to the ground. Uh, I think I have a couple more here. Let's see, 18 source. Um, I thought we already did that. Oh, wait, we did the 11 <laughs> external trigger. Sorry, these are numbered in no kind of um, no kind of um, logic or order source. It's referring to the trigger source. So right now I'm on internal trigger source. You saw me use the external trigger source and a line trigger source is an interesting one. That's the power line trigger source, the 60 hertz. So whenever you trigger online, you are almost always going to get something like this uh, unstable signal. But there are some circumstances where you do want a line uh, trigger. Let me see if I can show it here. Um, I, I, it's good that I connected the, uh, wait, get rid of this. It's good that I connected this because this is something that can show um, something that's related to the line. Let me see here. So I'm gonna turn off A. Uh, I thought I turned off A, why is it still showing? Turn on B, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> I guess it always wants to show something. And I'm gonna zoom in. Uh, I'm gonna put this on AC and zoom in a lot. So normally that wouldn't show anything, um, but right now it's showing something because I connected this wire. So so this acts as a kind of an RF, it, like an antenna. It picks up a nearby time varying signal from things. So. So that's uh, what it's uh, there. And right now it's showing a stable signal because uh, I'm triggering off of the power line. So let me trigger this off of the external, which is the TTL signal from the function generator. Then now it's not a stable signal, but when I trigger it from line, it shows a stable phase relationship. And when, you know, when I'm grabbing both ends, then my body's acting as an antenna, so it's getting even better signal. Um, and this uh, fa stable phase relationship, what that's showing is that um, whatever's showing on that screen there must be related to power line. Uh, so it's just, it, it, the power line trigger is sometimes useful for that, um, for displaying signal that's somehow related to the power line, which usually happens to be noise. But for displaying any other signal, you want external or internal trigger. That's and what it's designed for. Um, let's see here. So I just did a 18, 19, yeah, power switch. Um, <laughs> I said it's a bit of an obvious one on this one. Um, but uh, there are oscilloscopes where power switch is super hard to find. Uh, 20 focus, uh, you know, I didn't uh, this, uh, show the operation of number 20 and 21. Which are these two? Uh, let me get rid of this line. Sorry, this is a bit of a, in the way. So that's the number 20 and 21. 20 is the one on the right, focus. 21 is the one on the left, intensity. And those knobs control how, uh, how the oscilloscope, uh, the screen appears. So let me first to show you the intensity knob. I mean, you know, they do what it kind of sounds like. Intensity knob, it changes the intensity. It can make the screen dimmer or it can make the screen brighter. And you just uh, want to set the intensity knob to something that's uh, reasonable for your ambient light. Uh, it's like intensity on your monitor. And the focus knob, it, um, it, so the oscilloscope has a manual focus. And uh, there's a particular position of the focus knob that will make the trace appear focused. If it's too much to the counterclockwise position or to the clockwise position, then it'll be out of focus. You know, these are not too badly out of focus. Um, so you do want this to be as sharp as you can make it. it this is one of the sources of error. When you're making measurement of with oscilloscope, the width of the signal determines how precisely you can determine positions and all that. So, so uh, usually intensity and focus knob, you mess with it at the beginning and you don't change it unless something comes up. Um, 
20 to trace rotator. Yeah. So that and I have no idea what that is. And you can kind of see it from the shape of the trace rotator that it's a knob that's uh, meant not to be uh, used too often. Uh, you need a screwdriver to mess with that. So, um, so I'm not going to mess with that. Uh, if you are curious what it does, uh, you can look at the manual to see what trace rotation does. I have no idea what it's supposed to do. Um, uh, it probably does something. But, um, I'm going to respect the fact that it requires a tool to access it. So I'm not going to mess with it unless I need to mess with it. Um, 23, yeah, channel B position. So one of the um, nice thing to understand about devices like oscilloscope. So this is a two channel oscilloscope. There are other oscilloscopes with more channels. And um, it's good to understand that all those different channels, they follow the same layout. So once you understand how channel A works, then channel B works the exact same way. Now, there might be something interesting now and then. There might be a little invert button that does something that channel A doesn't do. But on the whole, this entire channel works exactly like a channel A. So, um, and uh, there are like channel four channel oscilloscopes. I don't think I've seen six channel oscilloscopes, but all those fancier oscilloscopes with more channels, once you understand the one channel, then you understand them all. So, uh, so number 23, so number 24, push invert. That's the one thing that's, uh, I don't know, a little bit new. Um, oh, let's see if we can do it this way. I'm going to display B. Uh, I'm going to trigger online. And let's see here. Um, let me set the time. OK, so let me. So right now, this is what you're seeing. I'm grabbing onto both end of the. Uh, the the leads so that you get that nice power line pickup with with my body SD antenna, and using my pinky, I'm just gonna press on that invert button. See what that does. It inverts the signal. Uh, oh, you know this is useful when you want to do signal A minus signal B. Then you can add A and B with uh, you can add A and B with the invert button in between that does the signal A minus the signal B. That's um, sometimes useful. Yeah. So, OK, I think we are almost done here. Uh, 25 volts per division, 4 channel B. So it's the same deal as before. Uh, 26 variable, uh, 4 channel B. Uh, 27 vertical input, um, 4 channel B. 20, I don't know if, did I put, I don't, I wonder if I, Made a typo when I was copying this over. Yeah. Feels like they're leaving some words out. Uh, yeah, I'll just l let it be. Or yeah, it says page three of the equipment manual. Did I really? So twenty-seven, twenty. Did it really not? Oh, oh, uh, and I guess here they actually explain why each of those. Two. Um, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, so anyways, um, ACD, it's a four channel B, 29 comp test. I don't know what that is. Um, yeah, I actually don't know what that is. Um, let me see in the manual. So that's number 29 here. Let's see if it says something that I can explain. Uh, comp test. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> I guess this oscilloscope has a component tester mode, and uh, there's something you can do with it, but um, I've never used this. And this is something that's specific to this oscilloscope. So if you wanted to use it, you would read about what is component test mode. So, um, oh, and these are the backside of the oscilloscope, which I guess we won't deal with. Um, so that's a. Uh, I think the um, overview of the oscilloscope, it's a, again, it's a tool of the trade. It's a, um, a kind of complex looking thing. It's uh, sometimes the first time you see it, it can be intimate. Oh, you know, sometimes oscilloscopes show in uh, like sci-fi because it's a kind of sci-fi looking instrument. 
of what I told you. Oh, you know, I've never had this on for two hours. I guess it does that sometimes. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so, so yeah, and uh, I want you to take this time to, I can say, went through double the amount of time I said I would. Um, but I, I did want to do this because um, it's a, uh, oscilloscope is an important tool. And I think one of the major thing that you are missing out from the fact that uh, we can't do labs in person is that you don't get to work with oscilloscope uh, in person. I, I really think that is the major thing you are missing out on. And hopefully for those of you who might be working with the circuits and whatnot, in the future, you you will see an oscilloscope in your life at some point. So what you are missing out this semester won't be permanent. And I, and I hope uh, when you do see a real oscilloscope that um, that you you feel like it's something that you've seen before. That it's not completely foreign. 